So I've been involved in developing the internet in Sri Lanka. And uh, so what really happened was uh, when it started when I was a graduate student in California. Uh, and this was in about 1986. And uh, so we were, a, uh, I was a graduate student. And then uh, we had this thing, at that time it, we really didn't even call it internet, we call it ARPANET. And uh, so it was something really useful and we thought, okay, why don't we have this back at home in Sri Lanka? And uh, so then we said, okay, let's try and find out how, how we could do it. And the first thing we did was we set up an email service and uh, it was dial up. So somebody from the US used to call Sri Lanka once a day and transfer email using a telephone line and a modem. And then after that, in uh, 1993, when I was back in Sri Lanka, we started building the internet in Sri Lanka. And the first uh, network was just connecting three universities in Sri Lanka. Then after that, we connected to the internet. And uh, then we had more networks in Sri Lanka. And then finally, uh, we have the academic network as well as a lot of commercial networks. So I was sort of involved in, you know, bringing that up from basically from zero up to where it is right now, which is basically 23 years later. So the first one was, as I said, uh, that we, uh, so it's not really that I always tend to say we, because it's not just me. It's not something where, you know, just one person sat and did it. It, it was always groups of people and very diverse groups of people. So the first group of people were a set of graduate students who happened to be in various countries, the US, Canada, uh, UK, and uh, several other places. Uh, and they had this thing called email. And uh, I think at that time, this was in the mid 1980s, uh, Internet was basically email. Uh, so because the World Wide Web hasn't even been invented. And uh, so we were sending messages up and down using email. And we formed a group called SLNet, Sri Lanka Network, which was a set of people, initially maybe two or three, and uh, then it grew to you know, dozens and then hundreds of people uh, who were using email to talk to each other. And that was the first breakthrough. And this was a group of people all around the world. Many people had never met each other before or ever, right? There are plenty of people there who have never ever physically met. Uh, but we used to have meet, uh, we discuss things by email and exchange news. So that was the first breakthrough. And then we found that, okay, now we needed to transfer email to Sri Lanka. And we were actually making calls and it was costing like more than a dollar a minute. So we need to raise funds. So then we, we got together and started to raise funds. And that was the second breakthrough where we actually had to, you know, raise funds. Uh, then we set up a non-profit organization, which is actually still around, called Lanka Academic Network. So that, all of that I was, really happened while I was in the US doing my PhD. Mm -hmm. Then I finished my PhD in 1992, got back home. And uh, so by the time uh, we had a basic internet there, well, email was there, and then we started to build the internet. And uh, again, it was very, very uh, basic. So the first internet connection we got was between Princeton and Colombo, Princeton, New Jersey and Colombo. And uh, that was at 64 kilobits per second. And I can still remember, it was I think in 1994, uh, when, in fact, we hadn't still got internet into our university. So we had to go to the telecom office in Colombo. And uh, so they were showing us their brand new connection with US. And I said, my God, this is so fast, right? And we can see a page in like, you know, seconds. Uh, and right now, when we look at it from today, this was running at 64 kilobits per second. And just to give a perspective, uh, recently there was a site uh, which uh, had got an internet connection long ago in Sri Lanka and uh, they had got a 64 kilobit line 
and for whatever reason they had not upgraded this and they were still running at 64 kilobits and i was saying oh what what is this 64 kilobits it's so slow you can't even you know just to upload your web page takes minutes and that's the difference between 1993 and 2013 right where 64 kilobits my reaction was it's so fast to oh my god what are you doing 64 <laughs> is you know is nothing uh, right, so those were, I think, some of the defining moments. Another defining moment I can uh, mention is uh, in 1998, uh, we were approached by the Swedish International Development Agency and they said they wanted to fund us to develop the university network. And this was quite u uh, not useful. Uh, I would say this is, was very interesting or very unusual Usually when you want funding, you have to sit and write proposals and then give it to them and they will consider it. Here it was really the difference. They came and told us, we want to do this, we are going to fund this. Just write some kind of proposal uh, and we'll fund it. Uh, and the reason I believe is they have seen what we were doing with very, very limited funding. And they realized that uh, we were capable and we, we could do it. So basically they said, okay, we know you can do it, we'll give you funds. And uh, so that was something very interesting. And I think the last thing I would like to talk about is uh, when I watch my students or maybe even just people, uh, you know, just random people uh, using the internet. And then I realized, okay, they don't even know that this is anything special, right? They just open their computer and they use the internet. And uh, does it cost too much? Not really. It's very affordable, it's available, and uh, people take it for granted. So that's the last thing I would like to say. So we have got to a stage where, from a stage where we had internet just linking three places, three universities in Sri Lanka, to a place, where, to a point where like anybody and everybody uses internet. So that's, I think, the real great thing. I would definitely say sunny. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, so the internet is still young, right? So it's only 20 odd years, well, 30, whatever, depending on where, where you take the date of birth. Uh, so it's still quite young and I think it has many, many years to go before people say, oh, it's not the internet anymore, it's, you know, some new technology. And uh, still we haven't even come to the stage where anyone says, okay, here's this new thing which is going to replace the internet. Uh, so I think internet is going to be around for a long time. It will probably change. And I have no idea how it's going to change. Um, I mean, I have some ideas, but I really have no real idea. But I believe it's going to be there, it's going to be more and more uh, common. Um, and I believe that in... Uh, and please also I want to mention the difference. Okay, so here we are in Berlin, or maybe you are in... Uh, where are you, Raleigh? North Carolina. Uh, which city? Uh, Raleigh. Raleigh, okay, right. Uh, and, uh, and I'm based in Sri Lanka. And so there's still a huge difference between uh, what is available maybe here in Germany and in the US and in other countries. And there's another huge difference uh, between our country and certain countries, say in Africa, right? Uh, so where the type of stuff I'm talking about is not there. So we need to uh, have countries like Sri Lanka, India, and you know a lot of those countries uh, move to a play, uh, to a point where internet is ubiquitous. Then we need to get some more countries where internet is still not really there into a point where it's really there. So there's a whole lot of stuff which needs to be done. And it would be interesting to see what the future of internet would be, say, in the US. Uh, so right now, like, we have almost anyone or everyone having internet. Uh, but what's it going to be? So that's a question. There's lots of fears. Um, so one major fear would be privacy. 
So privacy is something which we used to take for granted. Uh, now we cannot. Uh, the other major fear I have is centralization. That, uh, for example, if I have a device, if I have a phone, right, it tends to say, well, I connect to my my home. I connect to this company and everything has to go through that company. And uh, so I think that's really a bad thing because the internet was designed as a decentralized network where every node is independent and can talk to anyone. Uh, and if you to centralize it too much, I think it's going to be really bad. Uh, so I think those are two of the major fears we have. And uh, so one of the things I'm working on right now is something called personal cloud, where today when you say cloud, you think of this huge data center somewhere, you know, where there's th huge amounts of data spent, but does it have to be centralized? Cloud is fine, but it can be decentralized. It can be yours. It can be at your home. It can be on your mobile device anywhere, rather than, you know, being in one huge data center. So that's something uh, which is in my vision that we have the cloud and all these new things be personalized. So one vision we have is for personal cloud. One thing I forgot to mention is language, mm -hmm. right? So internet started off at the beginning as very much English centric. So it started off in the US and then many of the com countries which joined were English speaking. Uh, and even right now, today we have the IETF running here. Uh, then that conference runs entirely in English. There's people from, I don't know, 50 countries or something here right now in this hotel, but uh, the conference runs in English, uh, which is fine, but the people using the internet are not English, right? I believe uh, already English is not the, uh, or less than 50% of internet users speak English. Uh, and other languages are going to get more and more and more. Uh, so we need to make the internet multilingual, and especially for smaller languages. So I come from a small country where we have two languages, uh, with one which is spoken by maybe about 50 or 60 million people, another by about maybe 20 million people, and then we have lots of other languages which are spoken by fairly small numbers of people. Uh, we need to make sure that the internet doesn't lead to that. So language is one, the other part of that is culture. Uh, so we have many, many cultures in this world. Uh, and the internet enables us to talk to each other. Uh, so what we also want to ensure is that this linguistic and cultural diversity is maintained and increased. Mm -hmm. uh, so internet can be a force for homogeneity, which is sometimes good. Uh, also it should be a force for heterogeneity, for diversity. So that's one of my hopes for internet, that internet be diverse. It helps us to be diverse. It helps us to maintain our culture, our language, and things like that. Uh, and the other one which I mentioned is making internet ubiquitous, making it available to everybody. Uh, my vision is that internet should be like water. All right. So you do not say, well, water is for some people only, right? Other people, we wouldn't really need water. No, I mean, water has to be made available to everyone. Uh, and it's either free or such a, such a low cost that people do not really worry about, okay, I'm paying so much for water. Uh, so we need to get to the same thing for internet, where it is something which is considered essential and such a low cost that you really do not worry about it. One is, it's, I, I don't believe in centralized action. So as I said, we believe in decentralized. So, and internet itself is decentralized. I mean, there is no internet authority, which I, we can go and say, oh, make this happen. It's never going to happen. If at all, the, only, the authority is the group which is meeting right now here, the IETF, uh, which lays down the standards on which the internet runs. Uh, so it's us all of us, so the people who are here in this conference, in the meeting today, and many, many other people all around the world, who should decide, okay, where do we want to go? And one is, we should take technical steps to make sure that happens. Two, we need to work with the governments in the countries, the international uh, bodies like ITU and so on, um, 
and civil society to make the internet go where we want. It will not go there by itself. So it's up to the people who have a vision for the internet to make it go where they want. And they have to engage the technical people, the governments, the international uh, intergovernment bodies, and civil society at various, various levels to make sure internet goes where it wants.